So the next presenting company is Inovio Pharmaceuticals. Inovio, I believe, has a very broadly applicable platform for vaccine development, um, both in immuno-oncology as well as more broadly. And it's a company that I've covered for many, many years. It's a pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Naranjan Sardisi, who's the company's uh, chief operating officer. Naranjan's gonna give us a little bit of an overview, then I have a few questions. If you have any, please raise your hands. Naranjan, thank you for joining us. Great, uh, thank you, Charles. I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, and share with you our story on, on developing antigen-specific immunotherapies to target uh, oncology and, and infectious disease uh, targets. The, I think, you know, we heard a lot about T-cells uh, today, all through these sessions, that if you generate the right kinds of T-cells, uh, get them to wear to the disease tissue, uh, that, you know, then you can see miracles happen. And, you know, we, we couldn't agree with that uh, any, any more. And on top of that, what I would like to add is, if you, if you can now do that in vivo, without any ex vivo manipulations, and you can do it with a remarkable safety profile, then, you know, that, that's what mm -hmm. immunotherapy should look like. And indeed, you know, the, it's one of the things that we've, we've achieved with our platform uh, uh, at, at Inovio. And I'm happy to share some data with you in that regards. So a uh, quick uh, look at our forward-looking statement. Uh, I guess also to remind me that we have now published over 80 peer-reviewed papers using, uh, based on our technology, as well as our products, as well as the preclinical and clinical data. So I'd encourage uh, people to look up those publications as well. So coming right down to uh, the generation of T cells and uh, what does efficacy look like in the context of effective T cells. So this is, uh, this is data from, a, uh, from our phase two efficacy study we published in the Lancet uh, last uh, September. Uh, and this was a study we did in, in women with high-grade cervical lesions. What you're seeing over here is uh, uh, the top panel, the top two panels is, is our biopsy specimens from one of the uh, patient women who entered our study at entry, and the bottom two panels are from the same patient at our efficacy endpoint. So this patient, uh, this is, keep in mind that high-grade cervical lesions are predominantly called, are HP, HPV associated, and our product, VGX3100, targets uh, E6 and E7 proteins from two different HPV subtypes. So the top panel, all the brown, top left panel, all the brown staining you see there is a biopsy specimen where this uh, pathology, pathologist stain the specimen for P16. So all of that brown stuff you see there is massive HPV replication, and that's what sensory pathology looks like. The bottom left panel shows that uh, six months following a, a final dose, this woman had cleared all of the HPV at, at her in, in her cervix. This is what a normal epithelium should look like. So we know that our vaccine approach can clear, clear the lesions. But how do we do this? And that's shown on the, on the right panels. What you see in the top right panel, uh, the brown staining there, now we are looking at staining for infiltrating CD8 T cells. Uh, at entry, you see a few spots. They're mostly in the stroma. Uh, not, and not many in the epithelial tissue where all the HPV is, but six months post the final dose, the bottom right panel, you now see a massive infiltration of CD8 T cells in, in the cervical biopsy uh, specimens here. Uh, if you look at the same stain in a, in a, in a non-vaccinated placebo-controlled patient, what you'll see is brown everywhere, brown in, in the beginning, brown at the end, and not much infiltration of, uh, of CD8s in, in there. In, in, in their cervix. So we know that we can get uh, tissue infiltrating lymphocytes using our uh, immunotherapy approach, uh, but do we need to be looking at, the, looking at tissue histology to be able to detect it? And the answer is no. We, we can drive massive levels of T cell responses, which we can now detect in the blood as well. So what you see here in green are the, are the vaccine recipients, and you can see that with each of the uh, successive doses of, of uh, immunization, you're seeing a, an increase of antigen-specific T cells that are now measurable in the blood. And compare that with the blue line for the placebo controls. So this was a large, randomized, multi-center placebo control study with over 140 subjects, three to one randomized between vaccine and placebo, where we showed that we can generate antigen-specific T cells through essentially a shot in the arm, 
these T cells now traffic to, we can measure them in the blood, they, they traffic to the distal side of the lesions. We see regression of the lesions. And what's even more exciting is that we can see the elimination of HPV, which is the underlying cause of disease. Uh, so how do we do this? So the platform itself is based on synthetic plasmid DNA uh, molecules, which we deliver by in vivo electroporation. Uh, what you see on this figure, the cartoon, it's a closed circular DNA plasmid where the pieces in green are the common elements and the pieces in, in color are the antigen specific pieces that we insert into each immunotherapy. So if you're looking at an ID population or an oncology population, three quarters of our product remains the same and then the antigen specific piece gets built in. So this, this has tremendous advantages for us from a platform perspective because you know, we have now uh, generated a safety database across uh, over 700 patients over 2,500 immunizations. Uh, and where, where are we taking this approach? So we, uh, just a quick look at our pipeline, shown in blue are all of our oncology programs that are in the clinic. Our lead program in VGX 3100 will be entering phase three clinical studies this year. Uh, we have a partner program with Metamune in uh, cervical and head and neck cancer, as well as other HPV associated cancers. And then all the programs in green, and hepatitis B, hepatitis C, as well as emerging infectious diseases, those are our, our collaboration programs where we have been able to drive non-dilutive external funding to drive our infectious disease programs. So I'll pause here and uh, uh, sort of to give you a, a very high-level summary before we get to the questions. At Inovio, we are focused on taking immunotherapy to the next level, which means we are focusing on driving the production of antigen-specific T cells. We've now shown best-in-class efficacy in, in, this, uh, in, in women with high-grade cervical lesions. We are seeing similar sorts of immunology data coming out of cancer patients as, uh, as in the data we've reported with our head and neck cancer study. Uh, and then we've also done uh, a, a number of uh, two major big pharmaceutical partnerships with, with Roche and Metamune as well as significant uh, programs ongoing with uh, NIH and, and DARPA. And, and Charles, I'll stop here and, and take questions. Fabulous, that's a great overview, Naranjan. Uh, again, if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hand, grab my attention. Uh, but clearly, um, seems to be a broadly applicable platform, some pretty interesting uh, collaborations for external validation. Also, you didn't mention but I'll call out that you've been able to garner a fair amount of um, non-dilutive funding for the infectious disease programs as well. So that helps to extend the, extend the runway. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point, Charles. So, uh, you know, in, in 2015, uh, we raised about over $70 million through, uh, through a, a DARPA program for driving uh, our Ebola uh, activities. We got uh, an NIH funding of, of $16 million to move our HIV uh, vaccine program forward. Uh, and then we've also gotten DOD grants. Uh, and again, they help drive not only our, our development of our underlying platform technologies, but it also underscores the ability for this DNA-based approach to uh, move rapidly into product development and address sort of these global emerging uh, threats that we are all facing. Yeah, let's talk about that briefly. It's not central to my thesis uh, because I'm not sure I fully understand the business model, but uh, prior to stepping into, say, some of the more traditional oncology indications you're pursuing, what do you see as the approval pathway and ultimate business model for some of the programs such as Ebola? Uh, today, I think he had some news on Chinkagunya Chinka Chinka uh, and Zika. You've mentioned how come your platform can move so quickly. So, so, that, so that business that, model and why can you move quickly? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. So the uh, so the business model is in the case of emerging infectious diseases, the uh, the strategy for us is you know you, you with Ebola we had a window of opportunity where there was an ongoing epidemic where. Uh, uh, you know, where you could do an efficacy study, but the epidemic does not uh, exist anymore, or, or thankfully it's died away. So, so we are really looking at the FDA's regulatory pathways for, for licensure based on the animal rule approach. And, and in this case, we would be looking at showing 
demonstrating efficacy in, in uh, two animal species, followed by a safety, uh, you know, safety and immunogenicity study in humans to get the product licensed. Uh, you know, the, the markets in those cases, and I would categorize Ebola and MERS, as, uh, uh, as markets where the, the largest market would be government uh, uh, agencies and treating first responders. Uh, Zika is a little bit different because uh, Zika has a huge market amongst, uh, you know, a commercial market amongst women of childbearing uh, uh, age and, and uh, essentially uh, childbearing potential. And that's, so, so there is a significant commercial market that's available for Zika that we would uh, look, to, uh, look to tap into. Coming back to the question on how can we move so quickly? And, and I think that really underscores the, the, the beauty of our platform, where we have now demonstrated the ability to move a, a, a large safety database, whether it's in infectious diseases or it's in oncology. We have shown that these are essentially designed, synthetic designed plasmid sequences. We've, we've got a, a massive bioinformatics program to, uh, to bring synthetic biology to bear onto our vaccine development. So we can change the, uh, the critical parts in and out uh, in a synthetic sense. Uh, what that also gives us is while you cannot patent natural sequences, because our sequences are different, our synthetic sequences, we get uh, uh, all of our products are IP protected. Uh, from an immuno immunological sense, uh, we call this a Syncon platform. Uh, from an immunological sense, in oncology, these small differences between native and synthetic uh, elements allows us to break tolerance against self-antigens. In a, uh, in, a, in a pathogen sense, the small differences allow us to get uh, increased breadth of, of immune responses against related but different pathogens. Pretty interesting platform. Um, let's talk about the parts of the pipeline that are more traditional, if you will, from at least our analysis, and that is <clears throat> the experience, excuse me, in cervical dysplasia, and uh, I guess you're also pursuing cervical cancer. Um, un uncommon, at least in this space, you're about to move into phase three. Um, and that means you're gonna have an end of phase two meeting very, very soon. What are the endpoints that you'd anticipate the FDA wants to see in phase three for VX3100 uh, in cervical dysplasia? What's going to define success? Uh, so, Charles, in our, uh, so the, the short answer to that is we, we will not know for sure until we have that meeting with the FDA. And, and uh, you know, our, our, and we're moving full steam ahead with, uh, uh, you know, with the meeting. Our goal for, the, for 2016 is to move this program into uh, phase three clinical development, uh, which means we're going to complete our end of phase two meeting ahead of that. Uh, our phase two endpoint was around the, uh, around the clearance of lesions. The primary endpoint was regression of lesions to uh, SIN1 or normal, and the secondary endpoint was regression of lesions and the clearance of HPV. Uh, this was, uh, I mean, our discussions with the FDA prior to the phase two and, and the, the phase one and phase two studies were very clear that the FDA has allowed us to go forward with this endpoint, uh, but with the understanding that the final endpoint can only be determined, uh, you know, at our following our end of phase two study. So our path forward, our proposal forward is to move forward with the, with the same sorts of endpoints as we, we had in our phase two study. Yeah, but that does seem like a pretty high bar and one that could be clinically valuable because if those lesions don't clear, some percentage, all of them who get cervical cancer, but some percentage of those women go on to develop cervical cancer. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the only option women have currently is surgery. It's an right. invasive surgical procedure which doesn't get rid of the HPV. So, so you have a, a certain recurrence rate associated with surgery, which an immunotherapy approach uh, eliminates the underlying cause. And I guess, you know, going back to the platform in phase two, could you speak to how the T cell response is correlated with clinical response, at least in terms of magnitude or timelines? Uh, absolutely. So. Uh, there's some data in the Lancet publication. There's more data that will be coming out. 
Uh, what we showed was that uh, uh, the T cell magnitudes of the T cell responses associated with regression. So the regressors had high levels of T cell responses measurable both in the blood as well as the tissue. Uh, and we've also seen uh, these responses show up after the second dose. We've, we've now seen responses, uh, both T cell as well as antibody, that gives us confidence that uh, there may be a predictive element to, uh, to, to ascertaining which patients go on to regress. But of course, this is all post hoc analysis, and we need to validate that in a prospective setting. So this has been very helpful. Are there any questions from the audience, sir? How many patients will be in the, uh, in the stage three that you're about to do with BGX uh, 3100? And will this trial be pivotal, or would that depend on the p-value? Uh, so we, we anticipate the phase three study will be a pivotal study. Uh, the, the numbers that we have modeled put us in that 300 to 400 range. Uh, it's a therapeutic setting, so unlike uh, prophylactic vaccination, the numbers don't have to be very large. Uh, but again, all of this needs to be vetted with the FDA. And as, but we, we're, we're the study as we have designed puts us in that three to 400 range. We'll look forward to that end of phase two meeting. Any other questions? Then I think we have a break. Naranjan, I appreciate you spending time with us.